Welcome, I'm Ryan Holger with TEC. Um, this week's webinar topic is the Carrier Core and Bryant Housewise thermostat. Uh, it is the same thermostat with different branding. Uh, because the majority of people that registered seem to be carrier orientated, I went ahead and choose that slide deck. So I apologize to the Bryant folks, but it is the, in fact the exact same control with a different logo on it. So hopefully no one's uh, offended by that. Um, so the thermostat itself, as you can see, it's a touchscreen thermostat. It is Wi-Fi accessible, which is obviously something all modern thermostats have been moving towards. Um, I'm going to skip that right there to keep on track here. All right, so residentially speaking, which is the main target of this thermostat, uh, everybody's online, everybody has cell phones, everybody has tablets, everybody has uh, uh, laptops. At my house, we have 30-some different devices connected to our Wi-Fi network, and we don't even have any crazy home automation stuff. Everything's just what I would call normal things that a family would have. Um, so everything's getting connected, and there's no reason that people would not want their HVAC system to be connected as well. So 70% of the houses have home internet access. That's you know nationwide. In most of your guys' cases that are in the Chicagoland area, that number is significantly higher. Um, well more than half people have smartphones. By the way, this is 2013 data, or excuse me, 2014 data, which is the last year I have full data for. Um, but everybody's pretty much got a smartphone now if you're in a metropolitan area. And tablets now have exceeded 50% as well last year, but as of 2014, it was 42%. So everybody's got plenty of gadgets and apps and things to connect to these type of things. This is what the thermostat market looks like for the United States. Um, 2014, uh, 2012 through 14 is actual data. 15, 16, and 17 was uh, forecast data. Um, but as you can see, that blue bar is your regular traditional thermostats, programmable and non-programmable. And the green bars are the Wi-Fi thermostats. So the regular thermostat sales pretty much stay constant, right? So 5.2 million, 5.4, 5.5, 5.3. Uh, they're actually going to probably start squeaking back down as more internet stats come into play. But the green bar, the web stats you can see has been growing 1.1, 1.5, 1.8, uh, likely 2.2 this year when we see final data and continually growing from there. And in about another year and a half or so, it'll be about 25% of the total thermostat market. And eventually, as I would imagine, it'll be the entire thermostat market at some point here. So people that are selling Wi-Fi thermostats today, a lot of it is done through home automation companies, home security companies, wireless providers like Comcast and folks like that. Utility companies are involved in it. Um, the big box stores, the Home Depots and Menards, and those guys are selling these stats. Uh, there's a lot of people involved in selling Wi-Fi accessible thermostats to homeowners, and it's usually not the HVAC contractor yet. We're hoping that changes, obviously, because we live and work in the HVAC industry. Um, so when you look at where they're actually sold at, for 2014, that blue section was all thermostats, Wi-Fi and non-Wi-Fi. 62% were sold by the HVAC trades, if you will. 23% uh, retail and then smaller wedges by the utility and security companies and stuff like that. Uh, that's expected to um, be fairly consistent uh, in the next coming couple of years. However, you look at Wi-Fi thermostats, the blue there, 34%, shows what HVAC folks have been doing. Right, So we sell 62% of all thermostats. When it comes to Wi-Fi stats specifically, we only sell a third of them. Uh, so that's telling me that HVAC contractors don't do a good job of promoting Wi-Fi thermostats, or at least not as good of a job as the retail-based trades and industry does. Um, retail, like you know, home performance places and Best Buy and those guys, 27%. Um, and then the, uh, the security companies, 33%. Utility companies, 4%. And in the Chicagoland area, utility pie is growing very rapidly with ComEd's new program as well. Uh, anticipated that into by 2017, the HVAC folks get a little bit more caught up and are doing about half of the Wi-Fi thermostat market. So that's basically double the Wi-Fi stats that we sell now, which is why we thought it was kind of important to have these Wi-Fi Wednesdays. Uh, if you didn't notice, uh, if you look at our master training schedule, 
every Wednesday we have some sort of Wi-Fi training class, whether it's a carrier core class, a Honeywell Lyric class, uh, Infinity class, Housewise, Evolution thermostat. There's so many of these things. We have something like 30 some different Wi-Fi thermostats that we've been selling for the past 10 years. Um, so there's tons of them that we've been working on from a training standpoint. So every Wednesday there's something. How often does a homeowner actually get offered a thermostat? Only 55% of the time is a homeowner even asked if they would like a new thermostat, let alone, let alone a Wi-Fi one. Um, most HVAC contractors change out a furnace and leave the existing thermostat there. I shouldn't say most. 45% leave the existing thermostat in place. Um, so we've got all these people feeding into the pie here, promoting Wi-Fi connectivity to your home. And we just need to get the HVAC folks being part of that piece, if you will. So in terms of the carrier stuff that we do sell, um, these are the people typically buying carrier type products um, as we categorize people based on their demographics. Um, so there's lots of different, you know, slices of the pie here, um, you know, where people are in the economic scale, where they're at in the age type of thing. Um, and the carrier tends to be a little bit higher than, than average, obviously. Um, so people that we anticipate that would be interested in Wi-Fi thermostats, I mean, for the most part, it's it's everybody. I mean, it's hard to exclude any specific group. I know right off the bat, people want to say, oh, yeah, you know, retirees don't really want it. My parents have a Wi-Fi thermostat. They don't know they have a Wi-Fi thermostat, but they have a Wi-Fi thermostat. Um, and that happens a lot. People's kids, like me, put it in their house because I want to help them, you know, fix things remotely for them. Um, so um, there are people that are, you know, big players, have a lot of money. They may want to have this type of technology. Um, there's specific age groups that really, uh, really tend to uh, adopt it well. And you might not have expected it, but it's it's that baby boomer age, that 50 to 64 age group that has been one of the fastest growing segments for this web accessible type technology. I mean, you would think it would be the 22 year olds, but the 22 year olds don't own houses and hence don't own HVAC and hence probably don't care about buying a thermostat. People in their 40s, 50s, 60s do own these things. And once you get up into that age, you tend to vacation a lot more or you go to warm climates for three months out of the year and you would like to keep remote tabs on your Chicago area property. Uh, so those folks are definitely a high target. That upper middle income group kind of goes along with that discussion. And typically the people that want Wi-Fi access are very commonly college educated level people. Uh, it's a pretty common request. All right, so the thermostat itself, that was just to kind of give you a, a highlight of, of, of the thermostat snapshot industry. I know I went through it a little bit quick, but I'm trying to make up a little bit of time because I, uh, I started uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes late here with the technical difficulties. So I'm trying to make up a little bit of time. The thermostat itself, uh, very nice touch screen uh, for you guys that have used like the infinity or evolution stats. This screen is a more modern version. The screen is very responsive. It is exactly like using your iPad or your cell phone touch screen. It's that kind of screen. Um, the goals of this particular thermostat are not just to get your stat on Wi-Fi. There are several efficiency related features of this thermostat that we will talk about and how they might be able to save someone more energy than just a standard programmable thermostat might have saved them. Uh, it's intended to be simple to use. As you can see, it does have a big display. We'll go through what some of the screenshots look like. And it is also intended to make scheduling very easy, which, as you probably know, most people that have programmable stats don't schedule them because they get frustrated with scrolling through little tiny screens. So we'll go through that and show you how that works as well. And obviously we feel, you know, with Carrier and Bryant products that are well-established brands, those manufacturers know how best to control HVAC equipment versus other companies that have, you know, perhaps grown out of the IT world that don't really have any HVAC experience or know how to properly connect to certain types of equipment. So from an efficiency standpoint, um, there's some benefits for the dealer as well as the consumer. Um, you can use this type of thermostat with new or existing systems. I know a lot of you guys on this call do a lot of infinity and evolution type stats, and those are fantastic stats. I have that stat in my house, but it only works with certain furnaces and certain fan coils and air conditioners. Whereas this core thermostat and the housewise Bryant version of this thermostat, you can use them with any HVAC system. Um, it's regular HVAC wiring on that side of the equation. Uh, so it does allow the dealer to use this in much more, much greater applications than they would some other cool stats. Um, and we'll show you what some of the savings discussions look like. 
Um, consumers, on average, are saving about 20%. Um, that's based on a third-party third-party study compared to people that put their thermostat, you know, in hold at 72 degrees all the time. There is some intelligent adaptability to the scheduling. Uh, I'll talk about and show you how that works. Uh, that can help you save additional energy beyond just a regular programmable stat. And there's also lots of energy reporting and energy tip tools that are available through the thermostat as well as the thermostat apps that will help consumers save additional energy even beyond that. Uh, wiring is very simple, as you'll see, we'll go through some of the wiring discussion, um, but it's actually on, on, an on-screen guided wiring setup, um, and it'll actually send out signals to test which terminals you actually wired something to do, wired something to, and then it'll ask you, did you actually mean to wire something to G? Because we see you have cooling, Y, wired, but you didn't wire a fan. Are you sure? So it'll kind of check some of that stuff and maybe you pull it back off the wall and realize, oh, I didn't put anything under that terminal or, oh, the connect connection was loose. Uh, the back plate of the thermostat does have its own built-in level, which is nice. All of you guys have been to houses and buildings that have had thermostats on a slight angle. And if you're like, like my wife, you find that annoying. So being able to easily level it without even having to, quote unquote, break out the level uh, is nice. There's no screwdrivers needed for the wiring section of the thermostat. It's all push block terminals, very much like uh, the buttons you have on your uh, uh, speakers for your receiver and your other AV equipment type stuff. Um, so that helps the dealer out. From the homeowner's end, there's some things that make it simple too. Um, the smartphone uh, type screen, like I mentioned before, the navigation of the thermostat, the, the, the responsiveness of the touch screen is just like using your modern cell phone uh, as opposed to some older thermostat screens that came out, you know, three, four years ago. Uh, and then obviously you can access the thermostat anywhere. You can access it when you're at work, when you're on the beach, when you're jogging, whatever you want. It makes it fairly uh, useful for the homeowner. Um, from the dealer's end, um, the customer can pull up a screen that has their dealer contact information. When the customer receives an alert message from their thermostat because there's a problem at their home, it'll also tell them, you know, who their dealer is and refer them to that, that person. Uh, and there's also a portal being developed so dealers will be able to log in to customers' thermostats and support them that way. Um, assuming the customer wants the dealer to be able to do that, the, the customer could always choose not to. But... Uh, as a default, we'd want the customer to let the dealer log into their stat remotely and help them troubleshoot problems. Um, we realize that some customers can install their own thermostat, and maybe those are the people that are going to Best Buy or whatever to buy their thermostat, and that's just the way it is. But a lot of people don't have any idea how to wire a thermostat. It's not like it's an audio-visual speaker where it's a two-wire thing. I mean, it's, it's five, six, seven wires, and most people don't understand what all those wires mean. And they pull their thermostat off the wall, and they'd really rather just have a contractor do it. So we realize there's some do-it-yourselfers, but most people would rather have a professional do it. Furthermore, you guys, who are mostly HVAC contractors, if you're offering these type of thermostats, when you're upgrading somebody's furnace or their boiler or their AC or whatever, it's just really easy, easy for people to say, yeah, yeah, I want web access to my furnace, even though you know that really means the thermostat. It's, you're selling it to them so they can access their furnace remotely. And there's no reason to put in a crappy stat and then let them go to Home Depot later and buy a stat six months from now. Just offer it to them right off the bat when you're when you're selling them a furnace. All right, so this is what the thermostat looks like. It is a square thermostat. It is four inches by four inches. There's a proximity sensor on the stat that is used for dimming the screen to save energy as well as not have it just be, you know, this bright, shiny thing, especially if it's like in your bedroom or something like that. You may not want it lit up all the time. It might be annoying. So after you leave the thermostat, it goes dimmer, and you can control how dim you want it to be and stuff like that. And as you come up and stand in front of the thermostat, um, it'll actually go back to being, being brighter. There is a humidity sensor built into the thermostat, just like there's a temperature sensor built into the thermostat. So it does do both. Um, as you'll see in a little bit, we can control a humidifier with the stat or a dehumidifier or a dehumidification sequence on a regular AC system, or we can use an ERV or something like that too. So there's lots of stuff we can do with that. We'll talk about that a little more in a, in a few minutes here. Uh, on the right-hand drawing, you can see the quick release blocks I was talking about. So your wires just come in the side and you just push them in. Um, as, if you're using solid thermostat wire, 
uh, it works fantastic. And most installations have solid wire. If for some reason you are using stranded wiring, stranded cable, like we would have done for commercial automation systems, then these push terminals don't work so hot. But fortunately in our industry, we've been using solid wire for decades and decades and decades. So it should be great for most people's applications. Uh, I will warn you that the, if you look at the thermostat, the two screw holes on the back plate are vertical. So if you have a horizontal junction box installed, you are going to find that annoying. There is no horizontal mounting kit, if you will. So it is only meant for vertical junction boxes. Additionally, you will also find that it does not line up with the dimensions of the junction box. So in most cases, what's happening if you have a junction box, which is not most houses, but if you do, like in a new construction situation, you're probably putting a plate on the junction box and then you're screwing this to the plate. Uh, not a big deal, but just something to think about when you're installing it. Um, if you're just putting it into the drywall, then it works great, which is what most existing houses already have. Um, this is a two heat, two cool thermostat. If you're doing traditional gas furnace with AC, um, you can also do it on a two stage heat pump plus have the auxiliary stages of heat. Uh, so you could end up with, you know, with, you know, three total stages of heat in that regard. Um, three stages, excuse me, three stages of heat if you were using a hybrid system where you have gas furnace with a heat pump kind of thing. Um, if you're using a straight heat pump, you would have two stages. Um, oh, I just did that screen. Okay. Um, this is what you get in the box. It's what you would expect. Um, there's a back plate. There's actually two back plates. There's a regular one, which is the same exact dimensions of the thermostat, which looks nice and sleek. Then there's the quote unquote goof plate, which is the big hunking large one. I forget the exact dimensions, but it's like five inches or so square versus three inches of the thermostat. So it helps you cover up a little bit more mess in the wall that you might've made. Cause honestly, none of us in the HVAC industry are very good at drywall work. So the back plate may help you out in that regard. And then you get the normal hardware, like you'd expect the drywall anchors and screws and installation book and all that kind of stuff. All right. So once you mount this thing to the wall and put all your wires in and put the power back on to the furnace or whatever you're wiring to, um, the configuration screens will come up and you'll see a screen like this wiring confirmation that will automatically go out and detect which terminals you've put a wire under and give you a report like this screen here shows telling you, okay, you've wired up six things, Y1, Y2, G, common, um, hot, and a reversing valve. So this is in this case, obviously, is a heat pump. Um, they'll tell you what you wired to. Now, if you actually wired more stuff than that, you don't see it lit up here. You want to take the thermostat off the wall and see if you got a wire that's not all the way under the terminal or the wire wasn't stripped or something like that. Um, if you're doing something weird, and you're not going to be able to detect the wires that you're putting onto the terminals. Um, you may have to, on the left-hand side, turn off the auto configuration, go to disable, and then manually tell it which wires you're going to use. Um, for example, when I do the hands-on classes that we do, we just wire up RNC on the table to power up the stat, but we go in and put it to manual configuration so we can lie to it and tell it we have heating and cooling equipment actually wired to it. So sometimes you could do that stuff if it's not detecting what you really want it to. It'll also warn you if it thinks you should have something that you didn't. So in this case, we picked a AC system with Y1 and reversing valve um, for heat pump. And it's saying, well, shouldn't you really have the fan wired also? Why didn't you wire the G terminal, right? So it lights that up in red and gives you a big warning before you proceed and says, is this really what you want to do? So if you did forget to wire something or something's missing, it'll try to protect you a little bit and help you out with that kind of thing. Uh, I know I didn't mention it earlier, but if people have questions, uh, please type them in the question slash chat box, which is down on the bottom uh, right hand side of the screen, and I'll do my best to answer them. I'll look at it every five minutes or so and try to uh, try to answer them uh, for you as we as we move along here. I did not mean to click that. Um, so after we tell which wires we have, or after it detects, it's on, it detects them on its own, we can confirm what we're actually going to control. In this case, it's a one-stage heat pump with one stage of electric heat, and I don't have any accessories. Right? If I had two stages, I could tell that I have that. If I didn't have any cooling, I could tell that I had that. If I did have a humidifier or a dehumidifier or something like that, I would tell it, yes, I have an accessory, and I would be able to do that. Uh, by the way, it, it does one accessory. It's either a humidifier, a dehumidifier, 
or in uh, ventilation, which would be an ERV or a uh, ventilation damper or something like that. Um, so that's the equipment configuration. Then it'll give you the next step, and it tells you these steps as you're doing them. Gives you nice little check boxes so you can, you know, see that you where you're at in the progress. So that was equipment configuration. Then you would set up preferences, set up your Wi-Fi network connection, and then the uh, final user's web portal access. Um, if I do have an auxiliary heater, in case of a heat pump, it'll ask me if I have a dual fuel system, which means I have a furnace in conjunction with the heat pump. If I say no, that means I don't have a furnace, so I have electric heat in conjunction with my heat pump. Um, it'll ask me if I want to set up the Wi-Fi now. Generally speaking, I would tell you to say yes. If you think the customer is going to figure it out, they probably won't. The kind of customer that would figure out how to set up Wi-Fi on your thermostat is the same kind of customer who would not have bought a Wi-Fi thermostat from you. They would have bought it from a retail outlet. So the people that are having you do it are the ones that don't want to do it themselves. Therefore, you should plan on your technicians doing this for them. If your technicians are a little nervous about it or something like that, we do have classes, hands-on classes coming up for this exact thermostat for the housewives and core staff. So please do go on our website and register your techs for that class if, if they need to get more familiar with how to do this specifically. Uh, in order to set it up on their Wi-Fi, they do have to give you the Wi-Fi password. Some of them will know it. Some of them will not. Some of them may have to call their grandkids and get it. Um, if they don't know what it is, you can ask them where their router might be. And if you flip the router over, most modern routers do have the password on the bottom and most people don't change the default password. So chances are high that you can use that password and it'll probably, probably work. Um, once you hook it up to Wi-Fi, you'll get some additional stuff. Um, that's where your outdoor air temperature data is going to come from, your weather forecast data. Um, it'll help out with, um, smart recovery. It'll help out with heat pump balance points if you got a dual fuel system, locking out your system if it's too cold to run the compressor and things like that. Um, so you, you don't have to have Wi-Fi connection um, for the thermostat to function, but it does help with certain features. Um, setting up the Wi-Fi is easy. I'm not going to go through it in detail right now. We will cover it in the hands-on classes for those who want to know it, but it's just like setting up a Wi-Fi connection on your cell phone or iPad or whatever. You tell it you want to set up Wi-Fi, you select your router off of the list of the ones it finds, you punch in your password, you wait a minute for it to connect, and then you're in. All right, that's pretty much the basic step um, to that kind of thing. Um, I will mention that even though you should have no problem connecting to the router at the home, assuming you have the password, sometimes some routers, specifically some of the Comcast ones, uh, have firewall protection set up. And you or the Comcast guy may have to go into the router and open up a port on the firewall to allow it to support gadgets like this, like a thermostat or something like that. They may have already done that because they may be doing it for online gaming or something like that. Um, but some, some routers do have extra, what I would call unnecessary firewall protection set up that you, you might have to go in and allow that to happen again. Uh, if you need help with that, if you look on the bottom here, there's a phone number and they might be able to help talk you through that general process. Um, so once you're connected to the Wi-Fi, um, it'll ask you if you want to register your thermostat. That's something you would do one time. Um, it, you set up this thermostat to connect to the homeowner, Mrs. Jones' uh, online account. So when she logs in from her smartphone or her computer or whatever, the carrier or Bryant server that the thermostat is talking to knows who she is and it connects them together. Right. Um, so that's something you definitely want to help them set up the very first time. Um, after that, and it walks you through that, you know, it's kind of like a binding process and it says, okay, you create your account, you tell it what you want your name and password and address and all that to be. And then it's, it says, okay, go to your thermostat. There's this code. You punch that code in on the website and it, you know, it's a four digit code and it binds these two things together. Right. And then they're buddies forever. Uh, very much like if you've ever set up Bluetooth between your phone and your car or something like that. The first time you may have to enter a four digit code. The thermostat menu screens, which you see on the screen right now, are very similar to you guys that have done like infinity stats and evolution stats. Same kind of idea, comfort profiles, you tell what temperatures and humidities do you like when you're at home and when you're away and when you're sleeping and that sort of thing. And then the next button schedules, you actually tell it when you're at home and when you're away and when you're sleeping. So it really speeds up the process instead of having to go to a programmable thermostat and say Monday, next screen, 8 a.m., next screen, 
69 degrees. Next screen, 74 degrees. Next screen, okay, now let's do the afternoon. Okay, next screen, next screen. Instead of doing all that and then doing every day, you're basically going in and telling it four set points that you like, depending on the, the mode you're in, home away, sleep, and awake. And then you're going in and telling it when you're home away, wake, and sleep. So it's a lot faster process for the homeowner to, to change, edit, or add scheduling. Uh, there's also a vacation scheduling feature, which is nice. You tell it when you're leaving, when you're coming back, and what temperatures you want to maintain while you're gone. And then it tweaks everything a few hours before you get home, so it's back to the normal settings. Um, there are alerts you can set up. These are very useful. Uh, like I said, I have this thermostat in my parents' house. I also have it in several of our um, training centers and in my own office. Um, it's nice because we had a problem at the office this week when I wasn't there, and it sent me an email saying, hey, you know what? We've been trying to heat your office for the past two hours, and the temperature actually dropped three degrees while we've been running heating. Obviously, you got a problem with your unit. You need to take care of that. Um, so those alerts and reminders are very useful in that regard. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known it until I went back to that specific training center three days from now or whatever it is, and it had been too late. So now I know about the problem yesterday. I can get it fixed before we have a class or whatever. Let me check real quick and see if anybody punched any questions in at the moment. Questions. Raul asked if there's uh, remote sensing capability. Uh, there is currently not remote sensing capability. The thermostat has one temperature and one humidity sensor, and both are physically located in the thermostat, and there's currently no option to do remote temperature sensing. It's a good question. Uh, Tad asks how this compares to Nest. Um, so I'm not a Nest expert, obviously, um, but just as a general thing, uh, the Nest stat is meant to be a learning thermostat. It's trying to learn your family's behavior patterns. Some houses does a good job on that, sometimes it doesn't, depending on how predictable your patterns are and where you locate the thermostat. Unfortunately, a lot of thermostats are located in the dining room, which no one uses anymore, so that doesn't really help with its learning ability. Whereas the core thermostat, you're telling it when you're going to be home in a way more like a traditional programmable thermostat. Additionally, as we move along here today and talk about some of the other energy features that we're going to do with the core thermostat, regular thermostats like Nest don't do that. I call the Nest a regular thermostat. It's probably not fair. Like I said, it has the learning ability. But it comes down to how I run the HVAC equipment. It runs the HVAC equipment like every other two-stage thermostat you've ever seen in your life. Um, whereas we're going to do a couple of things a little bit differently with the core compared to a regular thermostat. Um, Casey asks how many wires are needed for humidifier control. Uh, it can support both a one or two wire humidity humidifier setup. And so it really depends on what humidifier you are, you are connected to and where the, your humidifier is getting its common signal from. So it can do both. And I believe a little bit later on, I got a couple, I think I got a couple slides on that. Um, but it really depends on the humidifier, not the, not the thermostat. All right, so back to some of the slides here. Um, there are some features that are in this thermostat that we've had in other Carrier and Bryant thermostats for a while. Um, and obviously we carried them over to this stat as well. Um, so there's pretty advanced heat pump controls in there to do dual fuel based on outdoor air temperature changeovers and things like that. Um, there's your normal um, humidifier type control. There's active dehumidification control where we'll engage Y1 of your condensing unit um, and then energize the dehumidification terminal of your furnace or fan coil to try to run as few stages of cooling as possible with as low of airflow as possible to change your sensible heat ratio to dehumidify more than we cool. Obviously, if there's an actual cooling call, we don't do that. But if it's a dehumidification call only, we can do that kind of thing. Um, it has the window protect like we've had in some of the high-end thermostats for several years. So what that does, it, in conjunction with your humidifier, we look at the outdoor air temperature. And based on the outdoor air temperature going up and down, we know that your windows are getting colder or warmer. And based on that, we tweak your humidity set point to prevent condensation from forming on the glass window, right? So the colder it gets outside, the further we bump your humidity set point down so we don't have condensation on the window. Just keep it below the dew point, basically. Um, there's fan control in there. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but you can obviously have fan, you know, fan running continuously, fan in auto. You can put it on a schedule, which is required by some of the codes now, um, that type of stuff. And there's some advanced scheduling features and energy features we'll try to hit as well. 
Um, so energy efficiency, obviously there's setback, heating setback and cooling setback. I don't have to you know, go through that whole thing with you guys, um, but you understand that if you change the set point of your thermostat, especially when you're not there or when you're sleeping or something like that, and you, and you tolerate a wider range between your heating and cooling set point, um, you'll be able to save energy. The energy loss of your house is a direct function of the delta T from inside the house to outside the house. So the closer I make the indoor temperature to the outdoor temperature, the slower the rate of heat loss of my home, and that's the more energy I save. I don't want to do that when I'm at home and I want to be comfortable, but I'm away at work all day. Obviously, I want to do that and stuff like that. So that is built in as it would be with any programmable thermostat. Um, there is an option for free cooling uh, if you choose to use it. Uh, you would need to use your auxiliary terminal. So if you were not having a humidifier or dehumidifier, and by the way, lots of projects like new construction homes probably don't need humidifiers as much as they might have needed in the past. So I may choose to use this terminal for something else. So I could wire up that terminal to a whole house fan or a uh, ventilation damper or something like that if I really wanted to. I would not recommend you use it for that. Personally, I would use the extra terminal for dehumidification sequences. Uh, plus, I'm a little nervous about somebody kicking on the whole house fan automatically with their thermostat and not opening the windows. Because you probably know when you turn on that whole house attic fan, you're supposed to crack up, crack open all the windows on the first floor. This thermostat's not going to open the windows for you. So the thermostat has the control ability to control the fan, but it doesn't quite work exactly like you'd want in that particular scenario. Um, but it will look at the weather data and it'll energize a free cooling mode instead of your compressor and try to cool your house that way. It just depends on what you are able to wire it to that can handle that if, if you have something to wire it to. So a ventilation fan, an intake fan would might be more interesting than an exiting fan or a two position economizer damper or something like that. Um, we have a super dehumidification mode um, for the AC and or heat pump scenario. Um, so the idea here is that even when the cooling call is over, we can continue to cool the space using your compressor to maximize the moisture removal even after we've hit the cooling set point. Uh, it works best with variable speed fan systems, obviously, because them can slow airflow down. Um, but it looks at the temperature and the humidity. And then once we've satisfied the temperature, if the humidity is still high, we'll continue cooling uh, if, we can, if we can do that. Um, in order for it to slow the fan speed down, it does have to be connected to a carrier or Bryant fan system because um, we're able to pulse fan signals to it in, or in order to change the speed over the regular G-wire. Um, we can also do a cool to dehumidify, and that can be done with anybody's furnace or AC system. So you can put this housewise core thermostat on whatever, on a train furnace if you wanted to. Uh, and what that does is it looks at the humidity versus a humidity set point that you've asked for. Say you've asked it to maintain 60% or less. We satisfied cooling temperature, but however, um, let's say we're at 67% humidity in the space still. So it'll energize the cooling system and it'll quote unquote subcool the space in order to dehumidify it. Um, it's a little bit different than you walking up to your thermostat and jacking the cooling set point down to do that manually because this will only do it if the humidity is high. Um, so generally speaking, you can keep your temperature set point relatively high, perhaps 76 or 78 degrees, and then only subcool it when you have to. You can let it subcool up to five degrees. Personally, I've been setting mine at three degrees. So if I set my set point for 76 degrees and I meet that, but I'm still too humid, it'll start cooling it below 76 degrees, but it will not go any lower in my case than 73 degrees. So it can actively do that. Um, I know a lot of you guys don't do heat pumps, but there are heat pump control features built into the thermostat. Um, so when we're in the heating mode and the outside air temperature is in a certain range, typically 15 to 40 degrees, um, we'll try to operate the blower at a lower speed. That's if you have this connected to a Bryant or Carrier furnace or fan coil that can support that fan speed control by pulsing over the G-wire. If you connect it to somebody else's unit, this obviously won't do anything. Uh, we'll try to keep that fan speed lower because if we do that, we're able to keep our discharge air temperature higher. Um, so it'll look at the weather data and try to predict that um, and use that feature for you. Um, can also energize heating during defrost. Obviously, you want all heat pump thermostats to be able to do that. When we're in the defrost cycle, 
We want to be able to energize the electric strip heater so we're not blowing cold discharge air on you. Um, you can optimize the fan. There's a couple different things we can we can do for that. Um, you can select the, the delay off for heating. So let the let the fan run for X amount of seconds more after the heating cycle is over in order to scrub a few more BTUs out of the heat exchanger. Generally on cooling, we don't do that in our climate zone because we want to let the moisture fall off the coil and drain away. But on heating, we like to extend the blower cycle for a few minutes longer if we can uh, in those cases um, and get a little bit more optimization that way. Um, depending on how your code situation is set up, sometimes guys are running continuous fan 24-7 for the code, or sometimes they've doubled the CFM and they want to run the fan for 30 minutes out of each hour, or they've quadrupled the CFM of outside air required and they want to run the fan 15 minutes out of each hour which are both things you can do in the Illinois state code. Um, if you do that, this thermostat can support that, that sequencing and you can tell it how many minutes out of each hour you wanna run. The cool thing is that if the thermostat's already calling for heating and cooling and hence running the fan anyway, those minutes that we're running heating and cooling count towards your fan ventilation time. And then towards the end of the hour, it just makes up whatever the difference is that you need to get you up to your code required amount. Let me jump on the questions real quick again and see what we have. Uh, Casey asks if the stat needs a common wire. Uh, I'm going to say yes. And in fact, I'm going to answer yes to the common wire on every single digital thermostat that you install. I know some of the manufacturers will tell you that you don't necessarily need one. It's been our experience that we've been having problems with thermostats connecting to HVAC equipment when the common wire is not there. In fact, if you look at the new ComEd smart thermostat rebate that was launched in July, that rebate program requires a common wire for all thermostats, regardless of what the manufacturer says, because the ComEd folks have noticed the same kind of thing in some of their beta tests. So I'm going to tell you to run a common wire for every single every single thermostat that you do that is not a battery-powered stat, right? So yes. Now, with that being said, if you only have four wires in the wall and you're putting on this thermostat that now needs five wires to include the common, you don't necessarily have to pull an actual wire. We have these kits called add a wire kit that we use. And you can use them with any thermostat. Um, they're made by Benstar. Uh, and it allows you to convert a four-wire situation into five wires. So the thermostat thinks he has five wires because he does. And the furnace thinks he has five wires because he does. But through the wall, you only have four wires. A little tiny diode goes in the back of the thermostat. And a little converter box goes down by the furnace. And then in the wall, we just use the four wires and split it at both ends. Uh, it works fantastically. Additionally, the core thermostat and the housewives from Bryant have a separate um, wire conversion kit you could use if you would cho choose to do that. Um, we have a few of them in stock, I think, but it's not our main one. We tend to use the Venstar one a lot because the Venstar one can be used on any thermostat, whereas the Housewise and Core wire splitting kit only can be used on those two thermostats. Uh, Jordan asks, are these smart features new for the Core compared to last year's model? Uh, great question, Jordan. Um, this thermostat did come out, I want to say, 11 months ago, um, and it is the same feature set. Um, we are re redoing the, uh, the education process on these thermostats because we've realized that a lot of technicians don't feel comfortable with it. So the thermostat has not changed in the past 11 months, just re-emphasizing it, if you will. All right, let's go back to some of these slides here. Um, All right, we talked about the, uh, the window protector already and that adjusts the humidity setting based on the outdoor temperature to prevent condensation on the windows. So I think you guys get how that works. Uh, the programming is really easy. You can do an interview based programming or the homeowner can, I should say, and ask them a couple basic questions. Basically, what time do you wake up in the morning? What time do you leave for work? You can also say, I don't leave. You can choose that as an answer. What time do you get back? What time do you go to bed? All right, if you can answer those basic questions, we know how to schedule your thermostat. And then I'll say, hey, you want something different on the weekends? You could also, if you wanted to, do something different for Monday versus Tuesday. You could, you could do a seven different days different if you wanted to. But most of you will live Monday through Friday is one scenario. Saturday and Sunday is another scenario. But you can pick and choose how you do it. But it's simple questions. What time do you wake up? Are you home during the day? What time do you get back? What time do you go to bed? All right, those basic questions. And it can build your schedule on that versus the usual boring data entry that a homeowner would have to go through. 
Uh, there's actually a, another feature on there that's kind of cool called Touch and Go. Um, this is something we have had on other non-Wi-Fi thermostats in the past. Because I'm not committing my set points to a specific time of day, I'm committing my set points to a scenario, a scenario meaning like home, away, wake, and sleep, and then I apply those scenarios to times. Because I'm doing it that way, I have this button on the left-hand side of my screen all the time, and let's say I come home from work early today or whatever. I could just, instead of going in and manually overriding it and saying, I want to hold it for X amount of hours or whatever, I could just walk over and just press that button and say, home, I'm home. That's it. Boom. Go to the home scenario. Or, you know what? I'm going to bed early. I don't feel good. Boom. Sleep. I'm going to bed. And I, I can just have those quick push buttons that we call touch and go uh, to, in order to kind of cheat the process, if you will, which does help save a little bit of energy here and there. Uh, like I said, you can adjust the screen brightness. I won't go through that because it's not really exciting. Just know that there's a screen brightness for when I'm using the stat and another one when I'm not using the stat. And I can also tell the screen to go off when I'm sleeping in case the stat happens to be located in a master bedroom or something of that nature. Uh, there's a weather forecast built into the stat. That doesn't sound super exciting at first because everybody's got like five weather apps on their phone and they can check them that way. But if you got kids and stuff, I found it useful at my house. I don't have this exact stat, but I have an infinity stat that has the same kind of feature. And my kids can walk up and just touch the weather button on the stat and they can see the whole forecast for the day. Whereas if they go check the weather app on their phone, then they happen to be on their phone for the next 20 minutes instead of getting ready for school. So they do it this way. They have no excuse to go on the phone. They can see the weather. They can get dressed. And when they're all said and done and ready, then they can play with their phones and iPads or whatever. Or finish the homework they didn't do earlier. Uh, but it's kind of nice. In fact, I even use it, too. Uh, I find myself using it sometimes more than my phone because it's right there. So it's, it's easy to do. Um, we'll skip the quiz stuff on here. So um, the cool thing is that the buttons are kind of in the same location regardless of the platform I'm looking at. So on the left-hand side is the thermostat, and I picked a bad thermostat picture here because it doesn't have the set points on the particular screen. But if they did, they'd be over here on the right, and on the left, I'd have my away button and all that stuff. Uh, if I click on this screen, it would, it would show that. The cell phone, which is picture number two, has basically the exact same screen I would see on the thermostat. If I go to a tablet, I get a more expanded screen with lots of more, lots of more, <laughs> lots more stuff. But up in that top spot where that blue box is, it's my same thermostat thing with my buttons in the same spot. And if I go to a PC, I get an even bigger screen, same kind of, same kind of idea. So depending on where I'm logging in from, I may see more data, um, but the navigation is going to look and feel the same either way. Some things you can do from the stat, some things from the app, some things you have to do from the website portal, depending on what it is. Like detailed energy reports, I'm not doing those for my cell phone. I got to do those off of something with a bigger screen. Um, but the thermostat, I can do my scheduling there, my set points there. I could see weather forecasts. I could set up my reminders and alerts, uh, that sort of thing. And when I go to the bigger screens, I can do all of that, plus I can do my energy management, I can change my passwords, uh, I can add thermostats and have multiple thermostats on my account, uh, which is actually really useful. Then when I open up the app on my phone, I can pick which thermostat I want off of a drop-down menu, that sort of thing. Um, I can get alerts and reminders on all these different devices. Um, so if I'm logged into the web portal, I can see alerts. It pops up as a big giant red box like I'm showing there on the top there telling you there's a problem. Most users don't use the web portal because most people don't use websites. They use their phone and apps and stuff like that. So down at the bottom there, if you have the app set up, it'll populate on there telling you, that in this case, a high humidity alert. And if I click on that, it'll tell, tell me specifically when the problem began. In this case, October 2014 at 3.10 p.m., my humidity got to 53%, so I must have set a limit that was something lower than that. And then who should I contact? I should contact... What does that say? Shepik HVAC. I don't know those guys, but I bet they're awesome. And then whatever their phone number is, which is the best phone number in the world. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, additionally, I can set it up to send me an email. Uh, I personally have found that very useful. Uh, I get an email. In this case, that's that middle screen there telling me that I have a message alert from my thermostat. In this case, they didn't name the thermostat, which they should have. It would have told you what the name of the thermostat was. Downstairs dining room, Wisconsin vacation home, whatever you called it. Uh, and then what the problem was, high temperature alert in that case, and who I should call. Uh, Brett's HVAC in that example. Uh, I find that useful because in my case, I have this at some of our own properties. I can forward it to our facility guy. 
and then he can uh, he can send the right person out there to fix it. Um, there is a dealer portal coming soon. Um, I know I said that like six months ago. I'm hoping that it's here. The big hold up for those of you that care is that we are currently do have a portal for infinity and evolution thermostats, and they want to combine that with the portal for these core and housewife stats, as well as the comfort uh, tier series Wi-Fi thermostats from Carrier and legacy ones from Bryant. So that way, all the Wi-Fi thermostats from Carrier and Bryant can be accessed from one dealer portal. So the goal is admirable. I hope the portal actually comes soon. But right now, you can't access the core ones as a dealer, only the Infinity ones. Um, but in addition to all the stuff you normally do with an Infinity portal, um, you'll also be able to do something like this screen is showing here. See all of your customers on a list, prioritizing the ones at the top that have current problems. On the map, you can look at them, and it'll highlight those ones in a different color, red or yellow, depending on the level of the problem. And you can kind of, you know, come in in the morning and look at that screenshot and be like, okay, I'm going to proactively call Steve Smith and Bob Jones and see if they want us to make a service call today to help them out before those guys perhaps know there's a problem and call somebody else. Right, that's kind of the idea with some of this stuff. Or if the customer calls up and says, hey, it's not doing what I thought it's supposed to do, my thermostat's not working, you can log into the thermostat and be like, well, it's working, you just happen to schedule it to be off for some reason, or you, you never, you, you took it out of auto mode and you put it in cooling only mode, and now here we are in December and you forgot to put it in auto or heat. Right, so some of those things that help save you time, you may be able to do remotely. Uh, Charlie actually asked a great question. Um, he's asking why the thermostat does not qualify for the ComEd rebate. Um, the ComEd rebate, unlike all the other ComEd and NICOR rebates and stuff like that, the one for the smart thermostats is bound to specific model numbers of thermostats. So it's not like, not like the AC rebate where they just say, oh, you got you to gotta hit whatever, 14 and a half SEER, and you can do it with any brand you want. It's not like that. They say you have to use this brand and this exact model number SKU of thermostat. And in this first year pilot program, they selected three specific models to do that because they each had a feature that they really wanted to basically try out, right? So the Lyric one has the geofencing. The, uh, the Ecobee one has the uh, motion sensor option, although it also has geofencing now. And the Nest one had that learning algorithm thing. So they had all those in there. They're collecting data on those actual thermostats to see kind of how they work and all of that. But the core thermostat does not do those features, and hence probably why they didn't consider it in there. However, it, it, it will here shortly do geofencing. And then perhaps when the program becomes, you know, full on for the combat rebate in June, perhaps then we can open it up to more model numbers. Uh, good question, Charlie. All right, let's go back here. Why is that not cooperating with me? All right, a few more things to talk about here. Um, some of these are just picture things just to show you what stuff looks like. So we'll go through them you know, really quick just to show you what the screen looks like and what some of the buttons look like. This is what it looks like on your phone. It looks exact same way on the thermostat itself. Um, the, the numbers are fairly large. Uh, things are fairly intuitive. Up arrow to change my set points up, down to change cooling. If I want to change the mode, I literally click on the word mode. If I want to hit menu, I touch the word menu. It's just like navigating any other app on your cell phone. And navigating on the thermostat screen itself is exact same as on your cell phone. right? So all those things end up looking exactly the same and the same kind of functionality. So whether I'm doing it on my thermostat, which I showed you a few minutes ago, or on the phone, which I'm showing you right now, it looks and navigates the same. So I don't have to learn two different things. I just learn it once. Um, the web portal is kind of where all the extra power is at. Um, if you go to carrier.com slash my home or bryant.com slash my home, uh, by going to those sites, it'll bring you to a place where you can log in as a homeowner to Infinity, Core, or Comfort Series stats, or on the Bryant side, Evolution, Housewise, or Legacy Wi-Fi stats. Um, and then from there, you can log into any of the ones that you have. Um, and you'll do, be able to do more stuff than you can do just from the app. Specifically with the Housewise and Core stats, the energy reporting is really cool. So I'm, I'm going to skip the stuff on the thermostat navigation from a web portal because it navigates the same way as navigating your thermostat. Um, you got all the same stuff on there. It's just instead of clicking on it, it's all kind of on one screen so you can see it at the same, the same time, if you will. 
additionally, your dealer contact info is always populated there for them as well. So your 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 name and number are kind of you know in front of them at all times whenever they log in that way. If they got alerts and reminders, they can click on it and see what those are. They can change settings. They can set up a vacation mode. Any of that kind of stuff. Um, energy reports we're going to go into in a little bit of detail here. So the energy reports, uh, which is the thing that's that's really different from the web portal versus logging in from uh, from a cell phone or something like that. So when you click on energy reports, uh, down that blue screen on the left hand side, you got all kinds of stuff you can look at: an overview, savings, month to month data. Compare yourself to other people in the same kind of community that that you're in. Um, see which of your smart features are saving you energy and stuff like that. So it, it's really cool and it's really detailed. The only thing that stinks about it is that when you first go to look at it, it doesn't say anything because you don't have any data. So it's basically blank. And so that makes it kind of lame. So you have to kind of remember after a month or two to go in there and look at it. Because then after you, well, you go in and enable it and then go back and look at it in a month or two and you'll have started collecting data. And then it's a lot more interesting because you can compare yourself to a neighbor or something like that and see where you stand. So like in this case, it's showing me that in September, I saved 45% energy, basically based on the number of run hours that I that I had versus not having it. Uh, I can look at things month to month, year to year, week to week. Um, I can dive into lots of details on here and you can go in as deep as you want. You can just see a high level screen that says, basically smiley face, you did a good job saving energy, Mrs. Jones, or I can click on that and see how good of a job I did on each kind of thing. Right. So if I would have clicked on that first box on the left there, the September savings would have brought this up and said, well, it told me I saved 45 percent because I saved 107 hours. But what did that mean? Well, that 107 hours of running cool time correlated to this many dollars for this particular month, $17. And since I bought the thermostat, that's $185 of savings. I can look at it graphically and see where the savings came from. Um, was it saying there for all of that time, uh, 100 hours came off of. Smart feature settings, 18 hours off of vacation. Um, but then I also had some override hours where I went and manually messed with my thermostat because I wasn't comfortable or because I came home from work early or something like that. And that took a little bit away. So my net savings was 107. All right, so I can kind of see why I'm saving the energy in some cases. Right. As we're going down, that was the overview. That was the savings tab. Here's the month to month tab. So how did August look compared to September? Well, I ran 20 more hours in September. Well, what did that mean? Well, part of that was because it was five degrees warmer in September, right, um, on the weather. Also, I had my settings on average were half a degree cooler, right? I also had one less day, right? So it tells you, in this case, three different reasons why. And if you don't know what the little cloud and, and, the, and the bulb and the calendar thing mean, you can read it down below. In September, the average outdoor temperature was 80. This is five degrees warmer than August. Right. And by the way, this is September and August 2014. So if you're comparing to this year, my screenshot is older. So that's why it's not accurate to this year. Um, September, your average desired heat temperature was 70.5. Um, but in August, you had a set of 71. Right. So that was part of the difference. Uh, September had one less day than August. So that's part of the difference. Right. Um, then additionally, it also gives you a tip down at the bottom. An expert tip says so in this case, uh, your weight temperature is 69. But the regional average is 60 degrees. If you can just lower your thermostat to 65, we think we can save you some more energy. And then over on the right hand side, you could say, nope, I don't want to do that. Or you can say, yeah, you know what? Let's give that a try. Let's see what 65 does for me instead of 69 when I'm not home. Right. And it's not always the same tip. The tip is different depending on the way you've used your thermostat. Yeah, I realize somebody could go in and change your setting manually from 69 to 65 and save the same amount of energy. But honestly, most homeowners don't even understand or know how to do that. It pops up on their screen. Maybe they got a big utility bill this month. They logged into the energy report to see if it happened to be related to their furnace. And their furnace or AC is telling them, hey, dude, if you just click this yes button, we'll save you some money. Okay, let's click the yes button. Let's see what happens. So it does make it a little bit easier um, for someone to save the energy that a, a regular programmable thermostat was always meant to save, but isn't always used the right way. Uh, the next tab down, community, you can compare yourself to what else is going on to people that are similar to you. Um, so I didn't show you on here, but when you first enable the energy reports and the reason it's not gonna collect data unless you enable it, it's gonna ask you like five or six questions like what state are you in? How much square footage do you have? What kind of house is it? Is it a single family detached house? Is it a apartment building? Is it a, is it a 
townhome? Like, what do you got? Like, how big is it? Where is it at? And what is it? Uh, tell me those things and I can compare you to some people that are similar to you that are using the same kind of thermostats. And then where do I rank in that discussion? Right? Am I in the bottom quarter, quartile, second, third, or top quartile? So right in the middle, right there is my state average. Uh, I'm over here a little bit to the right. So I'm doing a little bit better than average. I'm saying me, but this is somebody else's stat in Texas. I don't live in Texas. Although in the wintertime, it would be nice. Um, and then I can compare my set points to what other people do, right? So the state average in Texas in 2014, or at least in September 2014, was 72 degrees when people were home, 74 when they were away, 76 when they were asleep. What was I doing? When I was home, I had it at 76 instead of 72. Great job. When I was away, I had it at 70 instead of 74. When I was sleeping, I had it at 79. Um, so obviously, in this case, I'm looking at that away one. I'm going, wait. Why is mine so much different than the other people? Perhaps I shouldn't have such a cold set point when I'm away from my cooling set point. But you get the kind of idea. Uh, the next tab down, home efficiency. Um, so it tries to give you basically a score, if you will. Uh, it builds a thermal model of your house based on the way it's been running and that data you told it you had, what state you live in, what your square footage, what kind of house you have. Um, and comparing it to other people's houses and it tries to retain that data for you uh, and compare it to other people in your state and give you basically an overall score. So it's saying you're 78%, you know, obviously with 100% being the most, the most awesome. Um, smart features, right? So there are some smart features on here that do help you save energy. Obviously, scheduling your thermostat helps you save energy. Um, and you can tweak your schedule right from here if you wanted to. Uh, I mentioned the cool to dehumidify. Well, on the surface, it might sound like, wait, you're going to run the cooling more to dehumidify? Why would that save me energy? That would actually cost me energy, Ryan. Well, the fact is that if you don't do that, you are going to pick a lower temperature set point than you otherwise would have anyway, and you would have been cooling much more all the time. So instead of putting your thermostat at 70 or 72 for cooling all summer long, you set it at 76 or 78 and maintain those temperatures and be nice and comfortable. And then when it really is humid, then you allow this feature to subcool you just on those humid humid scenarios so it actually does save quite a bit of energy in that regard because all the other times you're not subcooling um, smart therm smart setback is actually really cool um, this is something that is most advantageous with multi-stage equipment um, so let's say you have two-stage heating and two-stage uh, cooling equipment um, I said before if you can lower so let's say let's say it's it's uh it's winter time and I normally like my set point 70 degrees and I can lower it to 65 when I'm not home, I'm going to save energy because 70 degrees compared to zero outside is a 70 degree delta T across my wall. 65 compared to zero is a 65 degree delta T. The smaller the delta T, the slower the energy is going to leak out of my house, the slower the heat's going to leak out of my house, right? So um, Normally, I want the away set point to be as aggressive as possible. So in heating, as low as possible, make it 55 or 60 degrees, right? Um, and that, that is true if you have single stage equipment, right? Because you turn it on, it's a certain efficiency and heats back up, great. When you have multi-stage equipment, the game really changes because running your furnace on stage one versus stage two is not the same efficiency. In one scenario, I have much less gas flow than the other, but... I have the exact same heat exchanger surface area. So if I have a two-stage or even more stages, if you will, but a two-stage furnace, running it on stage one is going to be a higher AFUE running point than it would be running it on stage two. So let's just say for sake of argument, it's 95% efficient when I run it on stage two, but it's 97% efficient when I run it on stage one. I know it's 2%. It's not a big deal, but it matters over the course of a year or two years or three years. It adds up to real dollars. So what this feature, this smart step, setback feature does is it looks at the current outdoor temperatures, the current indoor temperatures, and how long it's been taking you to recover each day out of the setback mode and get back to regular settings and, and then tries to calculate and say, you know what, based on that, even though you asked me to keep it at 60 degrees and you're not here, I'm going to hover at 63 today because I've calculated that that's going to be the most likely scenario that I can come out of setback and only run one stage of heating instead of having to go to two stages of heating when it's not very efficient for me to do that. So it's gonna to try to model that in the background 
without the homeowner having to do anything other than saying, yes, I want the feature. It's going to model that in the background and optimize that setback for them. Each day, you can have a different setback temperature. You just tell it your absolute setback, 60 degrees, and then it'll do 63 or 65 or 67 or 62 or whatever it needs to do to save you the most amount of energy when you're not there. So that feature is built in there. There's all kinds of other features where we can't go through every single little thing on the webinar, but if you come to the full, you know, three hour class, I'd be happy to go through every single feature in, in detail with you. And then there is a, uh, a full insights thing where I can look at all the system settings and the scheduling and the impact that the weather has and print off graphs. Um, so you can start off way up here on the overview and just say, yeah, I'm doing a good job. I'm proud of myself and log out. Or you can just keep diving deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into your own thermostat to see what's going on until you feel you know as much as you want to know. Some people will only use the overview or the first couple settings, and that's enough for them. Other people like me, I'm going to be on every single one of those screens looking at every single report that I can look at because that's the way my brain is wired. Right? Everybody's a little bit, little bit different in that regard. Let me check the questions, and then we're going to wrap up here. Jordan asks what the minimum and maximum temperature that you can set the stat is. I don't know that off the top of my head. And because I just changed to an office with a hardware connection instead of Wi-Fi, I can't go to the wall and look at it at the moment. Um, if you could do me a favor, if you, Jordan, just send me a quick email later and I will get that kind of answer for you. I'm going to put my email up on this chat box thing. And anybody wants to send me more questions, you can certainly do that. Um, but I'll put up there for you right now, Jordan. If you send me a little note, I will figure out the min and max temperatures the stack can go down to and tell you that. Um, but unless you're trying to like condition like a barn or something, it's not going to be a problem. If, I mean, if you just want it to be like 55 degrees or something, that's not a problem. If you're wanting to be like 35 degrees for heating set point, it might not be able to go that low, right? Maybe you might not be able to do that. Um, Real quick, though, just to kind of show you where things kind of fit into the grand uh, carrier scheme. We still have the Infinity stat up at the high end. For the Bryant guys, that would be the Evolution stat. The Core stat, or the Bryant Housewise, is kind of like his little brother. It looks similar and navigates similar. It has some of the similar features, but what it doesn't do is it doesn't speak to Infinity protocol, so it can tie into your modulating gas valve or your variable speed compressor or your zoning system. It doesn't do those things, but as far as controlling regular two-stage heat, two-stage cooling equipment, the core stat is a great choice. Um, and then we have the carrier Wi-Fi thermostat, which is the tier below that. It's a really basic, I don't, I don't want to say dumbed down thermostat, but it's just a regular Wi-Fi stat. There's no special sexy features. It doesn't do humidifier or dehumidification control or any of that kind of stuff. It's just a regular plain Jane thermostat that happens to be on Wi-Fi. And then you see there's also some non-Wi-Fi stats on there, which I didn't even bother labeling. Because quite honestly, in my brain, those things are phasing out. And three years from now, I'm assuming no one says that word about non-Wi-Fi thermostats. That's at least the way it is in my, in my world. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of those individual products. Just know that, they, that there are other, other options above and below this core thermostat in the grand scheme of the, you know, the product itself. So with that... Unless anybody has any other questions at the moment, I think that's really what I wanted to hit on. Yeah. Yep, that's everything we needed to do. Okay, so if anybody has another questions, type them in and I'll try to answer them. Otherwise, uh, I'll just wait a couple minutes here to see if anybody does, and then I'll, uh, I'll stop the recording and, and log off here. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate it.